20 seconds left in the half. Out of the shotgun again. McNeil waiting, waiting. Finally going deep. Got Porter out there. Touchdown! What a catch! What a throw! All the dreams, all the hopes for the national championship come down to this play. Young from the shotgun. Back to throw. Vince looks. Under pressure. He'll tuck it in and run. Vince to the five. Young. Touchdown, Texas. Touchdown, Vince Young. He's done it again. Vince Young has given the Longhorns the lead with 19 seconds to play in the game. And welcome, everyone, to Lone Star Yell Fight, where we're talking all things college football, Texas Aggies, Texas Longhorns, and the greatest country in these United States. And welcome, everybody, to the first episode of this football season of Lone Star Yell Fight. Uh, Texas is in the SEC, which means much like Longhorn uh, football, this show now means more because it's an SEC show. I am joined with our favorite Aggie, Andy Tom Chesson. Andy, we are eight days away from kickoff. Of course, college football starts tomorrow. How much you can actually get to watch tomorrow? I mean, uh, probably a fair amount. I'll, I'll peek in at Florida State and see if the quarterback really makes the difference or if they are the same miserable team that ended the year 13 and 0 and missing the playoffs. And I forgot uh, that feels like a decade ago. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. Uh Georgia Tech should suck. So I mean Florida State should win pretty handily, but it's it, it will be good to have real football back because frankly, I can't watch NFL preseason games that they are just mind numbingly bad because it's you know, especially the first couple ones are always Man, nobody that you're watching play is going to actually make the team. At least this week, everybody's made the team. So there, there's that. Um, the big marquee matchups obviously happen next week uh, when, when it starts getting serious. But it, it's very good to have it back. It's been a, a long time off. Uh, thankfully, from the a and side, we had a really good College World Series run. We had a good basketball season. So there's a lot of things to carry us over the – Winter of discontent, I will say, with this a and football program. Um, did you know we almost hired Mark Stoops? Did we talk about that? We have not. We we will today because, yeah, he that's a thing close, that almost happened. He was this close to the our, our head coach, and we were going to be happy about it. Yeah, so talk to me about the coaching search for you. How did that really – I mean, it was obviously not a great year for you last year as far as the football season went. Are you happy with where you ended what were you thinking through the whole process of again almost hiring Mike Stoops and such? Mark Stoops, Mike Mark Stoops, whichever enough, one. Have, one of the Stoops brothers, yeah, not the good one, there's not Bob. One one, and then there's the rest. Um, it, it was frustrating, and I think the most frustrating thing, and, and you know, some of this certainly with a grain of salt, is all the things that Jimbo Fisher preached uh, publicly. He didn't live too privately and not anything about him. I, I think he dedicated himself to his job. I think he tried as hard as he could. There were things about the game in 2023 that have started to pass him by, especially from roster construction standpoint. But the disappointing part for me is the kind of revelation that he had created the star system. Um, basically, if you were a highly ranked player, you had a different set of rules than a lowly ranked player. If you were a star wide receiver, you got yeah. treated differently than a second string running back. And you just can't have a winning football team that way. It just doesn't work. And maybe it worked when you had five years with a kid that you could pull them over to the, the good side, but it doesn't work when you might have a year you may get two, um, certainly no more than three with a highly ranked player. Jimbo recruited well. He built good rosters. He couldn't get over the hump because he just didn't know how to manage today's athletes and today's rosters. And that was disappointing. Leading us to a coaching search that um, there was a dark night where we all thought for a moment that Mark Stoops was going to be our head coach. And to the outside, I think a lot of people think a &M fans are very unified. We get called a cult a lot. Some of that is justified. We are a little bit weird. I mean, our, or we have an ad campaign around it. I'm okay with it. But uh, there's a lot of infighting, a lot of backbiting, a lot of the things you see in a normal fan base about certain topics like football coaches. This was the most unified I've ever seen the fan base since I was a student in 1993 um, saying, oh, my God, what are we doing? Let's all <laughs> make this not happen. And sure enough, 
by the time I went to bed and woke up the next morning, it was all gone. And oh no, that 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 wasn't a real thing. It wasn't going to happen. And then Mark Stoops had the oh no, I you know I, I considered it, but I really my heart's in Kentucky um, where they pay me less, and I don't have expectations to win games. So. <laughs> where they pay okay. me less. Um, but I think at the day A and M did well. Um, I, I think they did great actually with getting uh, Mike Elko as their head coach. I think for the first time, well, I know for the first time since R.C. Slocum left, we're hiring a coach who is defensive-minded first, um, but also has enough of um, enough of a sense to loosen the reins to hire a Colin Klein who is young and innovative and is doing really, really interesting things offensively. Um, so I, I trust that our defense is going to be good. I trust that our offense will probably get better as the year goes on because it is wildly different than the – mind-numbingly complicated system that Jimbo Fisher tried to put in place, which again, if you have a kid for four years, five years, right. you can make them work towards being a starter and learn a system. When you've got a year with a kid, it's really hard to learn everything Jimbo Fisher wants you to learn before you're perfect. Well, also, too, um, you have a year with a kid that's a great athlete. Just, just simplify things and let that kid be a great athlete. It's not like you guys are, you don't have to out-scheme because you're unathletic. You have great athlete, athletes. Just let them run. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the great thing about Elko is that he held on to a good majority. There were certainly some losses in the portal. Um, he held on to a good majority of the talent that uh, was on the roster at the end of the year. Um, I think I was looking at 247's ranking, and 247's a sad little website now that everybody's vacated, but they, they still do um, rankings. It's easy to find. Uh, of the top 20 teams uh, from a talent standpoint, from a returning talent standpoint, this is certainly skewed because it's based on their recruiting numbers and what ratings they gave these kids as high school seniors, I guess. Um, SEC has 11 of the top 20 most talented rosters in college football. Right. Um, A&M finished at seven. There's talent there to win. Uh, it's going to be a matter of how much, how quickly – everybody gets on the same page. And I think if there's somebody who can communicate at these kids' level, get them pulling in the same direction as the staff that Elko's put together. So I think we're in a good place from that standpoint. Uh, one of the big changes for the SEC, obviously, other than Texas and OU uh, entering, and since obviously you've been watching SEC football a lot more than me, no divisions this year. How do you feel like that's all going to shake up? I, it'll... It, it, Ultimately, the divisions are a way to sell T-shirts. So, yeah, if you've got two champions, you can sell twice as many T-shirts as you can when you just have one. Um, I, I think the coaches like it. I think it is not a temporary situation because we will eventually get to a nine-game schedule uh, when ESPN decides to pay for that ninth game. But until then, we play eight conference games. It is a brutal enough gauntlet that um, – you know, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, you're not going to play everybody. Uh, there are certainly teams that have easier schedules versus harder schedules. Uh, OU, for instance, has a brutal schedule this year. Good. Couldn't happen to a nicer club. Uh, Florida's got a pretty tough schedule. Uh, Texas and A&M both have fairly easy schedules relatively. Um, and and I, I think that's okay. I think it's going to, you know, rotate out in years, and I think other teams will be better in other years than other. So I, I think that all balances out in the end. But I don't. I'm not going to miss the division play. I'm certainly not going to miss playing Alabama every year. It doesn't hurt my feelings that we're not going to play them every year. Um, <laughs> I know your last experience with them was very positive. It's not always that way. Well, I mean, maybe, fact, I mean, I maybe not. They could be heading. They could be heading back to the Shula years, for all we know. I think that's going to be tough uh, because their head coach has won 90% of his games in his career. It's not a fluke. He's a great coach. The sad thing for him is if he doesn't win five national championships in the next seven years, Alabama <laughs> fans will hate him. He's a failure. Yeah. Well, you're not Nick Saban. So screw you. Um, it's it's going to be a really interesting year because I think Alabama is still a really good team. I think Georgia is still the cream. I think the way everything's going to shake out, Texas should be right there as one of the top three teams in the SEC. It pains me to say. Uh, and then you've got a whole cluster of teams that are just right under that. And then Vanderbilt. Um, Y'all get to play Vanderbilt this year, right? I hope so. I think we also get a cakewalk in uh, Arkansas, which I'm excited about. Uh, it depends. It, it, it's hard with Arkansas because they get all 
uh, chested up for these games. You know, or uh, this is the one game we could possibly pull an upset, and that'll make our season. Um, they did this with A and M a lot over the last decade, and they won one thing. I, so I was I, thrilled when uh, when Coach Sark said that. Uh, Arkansas cares more about beating us than they care about their own team winning. And the fact that they acknowledged percent. it, I was like, that's, a, you know what? I'm glad you at least said yes. Good. I mean, a thousand percent. And I'm glad y'all are here because they could stop treating us that way. <laughs> we were kind of the surrogate and it got really frustrating for them after a while, because again, in 12 seasons, they've won one game. But every year it's all, oh, this is the year we're going <laughs> to. Yeah. Uh, one of the, I wanted to talk, in, you know, obviously next week, or we'll get to talk a lot more about what we think about our our two respective teams' futures and everything in the in the conference. But we are there are a lot of people who think that we are done with conference realignment. I, for one, do not believe that in the slightest. I think that there's still more craziness to come before it all settles. Where do you feel like, as somebody who's watched college football all your life, what do you feel like the end game? final result of what college football is going to look like for per per perpetuity is going to look like when we get there in three or four seasons. I mean, we, I, I don't know if it's three or four. I probably have it targeted closer to five, but it certainly could happen sooner than that. Um, I'm still on the boat that you're going to take the top whatever number of teams and maybe it's 60, maybe it's 30. Um, and they're going to split off and be their own football division. And they're only going to play within their division. And it's going to be kind of, the Premier League of college football. And I think it's going to be limited. You know, there, there's probably a way to do this that's democratic. But I don't Explain think that for some different. people real quick, though. What you mean by the Premier League? Because there's a reason why you didn't say NFL minor league or whatever. You use Premier League for a specific reason. Well, the idea of the Premier League, and then you, if you watch uh, European football at all. Or Ted Lasso. Or Ted Lasso. That's a good entry point. Uh, there's always this way, that there's always another league, um, and, and I guess more recently there's been this talk of super leagues. Uh, it's probably going back a decade now. And what college football is morphing into is the super leagues, which is basically the richest teams, not necessarily even the most successful teams, although that would be, a, that would be one of the variables, but the richest teams, the teams that could afford the price of entry, will eventually split off from the NCAA from a football standpoint and do their own thing. And we are talking about the A&Ms and the Texases and the Ohio States and the LSUs and the Alabamas and the USCs of the world. Um, we are not talking about the Baylors and the Techs and the Mississippi States. Poor guys. Um, but maybe. Poor, maybe poor Ann it, Richards, RIP. I think, I think it depends on what that final number ends up being. But um, even the um, NCAA has kind of started setting the price of entry with this increase in scholarships. There's not a lot of schools that can afford 105 full football scholarships now, but that's and, and now what 25 full baseball scholarships and and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah you're and, right. Yeah, and so you're going to see a subset of schools who can play in that rarefied air. You're going to see a subset of schools who now will be paying. They're doing revenue sharing with their players. Uh, for A and M, that's a 20 million dollar budget item. I'm sure Texas has a similar number that they are now going to be distributing to these scholarship athletes who play for their school. Um, there's not a lot of schools who can play in that arena. And I think there's probably realistically 50 of them. Maybe there's a little bit less. But whatever that number is, that's going to be the group. That's where it's going to shift. And this concept of conferences will get to the point of, as since you mentioned the NFL, the National, League, the National Conference and the American Conference not that anybody really cares about that, but you're going to have conferences just for the standpoint of lining things up for a playoff. Yeah. And to but, sell t-shirts and, uh, yeah. So maybe, you, uh, have uh, uh, you know, tangible recognition of a season well played, not everybody can win the national championship. So yeah. yeah. So you'll have an sec and you'll have a big 10, but it won't really matter because it will go to, it will go back to this idea of the top 48 teams are part of the, these two leagues. And these two leagues play in one giant league, and that's all they do. Um, and there'll be a whole other subset. And that's, I think, okay. I, I think it, it's not what we grew up with, but that's where it's going to lead because that's where the money's going to take it. Yeah, and my sense is, one of my always big concern about that was that there would be a sort of loss of importance for smaller schools, smaller bowl games. But I have a feeling that there's enough people in football who realize that that matters as well, that those necessarily won't go away. 
one of the things when you mentioned the Premier League, dude, can you see a world of like relegation and rising up? Like, hey, if you're not getting it done, you're going to move up or down, like just like what you see in European soccer. As a complete, as a complete um, Premier League noob, and honestly, between Ted Lasso and Wrexham, I'm the most American soccer fan there is. Um, <laughs> it's fascinating. The whole idea of re- relegation or promotion is fascinating to me, and I wish all leagues did it. Uh, it makes the most sense in college football because it's the easiest one to do. I, I don't know how you convince a team in the NFL who's paid an owner who's paid billions of dollars for a franchise that you're now going to play in the European league until you start winning games again. Yeah. You have that, almost that, have to build that in from the beginning, which is. Yeah. They, but yeah. in college football, if you're redefining the whole map, I honestly see a place where you could do that. And that gives a group of five school or honestly a former big 12 school, a, something to play for uh, big 12, I think should be a lot of fun this year. Nobody's going to care. They're gonna get the playoffs. Brian, Brian McTaggart's gonna care, and that's about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I do think you're. I, I think it's interesting to watch just from um because you and I have obviously grown up in this. It's been a different world. Also, you and I both are followers of media, watching how that's all changed the landscape. And you know, there's definitely a group of our peers who automatically assume any change is bad, and I'm sort of over here going. I, I, any changes change will determine later on whether it's good or bad, but I think some of it's already proven to be very good in my opinion. Well, and that's, I think the other side of it is it will make a more exciting product when it all settles out. I, I understand the reasons why college football schedules are made the way they're made, but nobody is getting excited about Texas potentially playing Jacksonville state because they need to fill, fill a schedule spot. Yeah, it's a money game that you've got to pay this team to fly in and get their asses beat, and then fly back to wherever they came from. Maybe even take a bus, depending on how much money, how much revenue they're trying to maximize out of their payout. Um, those games are necessary. I guess they're good for the second, third, fourth string guys to get playing time, but ultimately they're a beating for the fans. They're not necessarily any cheaper. It, it's a lot of who cares. Um, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of fans choose that weekend to go fishing. Like they don't even stay home to watch the game. Or yeah. that's you know, if you, if you are the guy who gets married in the fall, that's the weekend you pick. <laughs> right. And you still have most of your friends gathered around a, an iPad or a phone trying to catch scores. I mean, because you're still the asshole to get married in September, October. Um, guilty. Right. I'm totally. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so, um, we talked about the like the media part of it too, and. I, I know that there's a generation of fans. I mean, there's some of them around my family that think, okay, well, your scholarship should be enough. And I think that they don't understand. And, and I was teaching some of my students the other day and they were studying the show roots and they were going through like the top 10 rated programs of the year. And the Super Bowl was seventh because they couldn't understand a world where the Super Bowl didn't dominate because football and its media consumption is different than it was 25, 30 years ago. These kids should be getting compensated for bringing in billions of dollars, which means a change in the whole landscape. Yeah, I, I think NIL is broken, um, and we can have a whole show about that, but the in, initial purpose of NIL was just, uh, sure. and you know that's, a, that's a, a kind of a lofty goal, but schools were making money on the backs of student athletes in exchange for a scholarship, and little else. Matter of fact, there was a whole lot of regulation that kept them from doing little else. The NCAA dropped the ball, and that's kind of why we have the situation we have now. But if I walk into a a fan shop or gift shop as a fan, and I buy a jersey from a player of a player with that name or a T-shirt with their likeness on it, and they don't get compensated for that, I don't understand how, as an American and a believer in capitalism, you don't think you you think that's a fair thing. And so the intent was you should be compensated for that. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that's not where the schools are making their money off the kids back. They're making their money off the TV revenue. And so now we're going to get to a situation next, starting next year where revenue is going to be shared with the athletes. And that is just, and the schools are still going to make plenty of money. That That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Shared, not equally. I mean, they're no. yeah. Yeah. And, and understand that too. The schools totally. take on the risk. They're the ones who, you know, put these players up. They are the ones that pay for these players' education, meals, 
room and board, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, they have the insurance on the stadium. They, uh, they have all the risk. They should make most of the money. But the kids should make some because for some of them, this is the end of their athletic, for most of them, 90% of them. Right, totally. This is the end of their athletic career, and they basically sold their skills in exchange for this. Um, will they have options after that? Yeah, education is still very important. I think these kids should get college should get college degrees and should learn things while they're in school. But the reality is some of them need money. Some of them need the ability to take care of their families. Um, and they worked for it. They should be getting it. And so all of that's good. If yeah, we kind of forget back. too that a lot of these players that come up are coming from, incre- I mean, poverty like you and I don't understand. So yeah. this is their shot. And I think a lot of people conflate the NIL with the unlimited transfer rule, and that's where the system really gets broken because they're two yeah. separate things. They just happened at the same time. So the belief is that, um, well, kids get paid, and, and let's let's be really honest at most schools. The stars were getting paid one way or the other. And, and I don't care how honest and wonderful you th- and pure you think your school is. Gold Trans Ams, baby. <laughs> 100%. Dead. Hey, Colt McCoy and his wife were on the, on a radio after he graduated talking about how much Colt made. And the, okay, good. Nobody cares. But the, the hypocrisy of it was. Um, I didn't get that. Anyway, so kids were getting paid. Kids are getting paid now. That part's fine. The part that's really broken is this unlimited transfer piece. And it's gotten back to the NCAA, refused to do anything. And so the courts got involved. And so the NCAA has lost all their teeth. So it's this situation, once again, where we had no reg- we had too much regulation. Now we have no regulation. So kids can threaten to sue and have literally unlimited transfers. And the only barrier they haven't crossed yet is this idea that I want to transfer mid semester and be eligible to play. And somebody will file that lawsuit soon. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about it though. There's no, like one of the things that struck me this year was because of this likeness stuff, because of uh, revenue sharing, they were able to bring back the NCAA video game. And I'm not sure I have seen like Andy, I was standing at a Yankee game talking to a seven foot tall Yankee fan and, who somehow was from the Bronx, but was an OU fan. So we're kind of going back and forth. The level of excitement that this video game is back shows you how much even the fans are understand how important all this is. And I think that's not a small thing to measure how much it does matter that these kids are finally getting compensated for the effort they're putting forward. Yep. Uh, and I think there are things that are going to go in place to fix some of the issue, not from compensation, but from the competitive balance transfer piece. One of those is getting into a super league where the NCAA is not not involved or not what they are now. Um, the other thing is going to be contracts. You're going to be written to handcuff these kids to the schools to a certain point. You already saw uh, A&M got some blowback from this, actually, because Walter Nolan, who was the number one ranked recruit in the 2022 class, transferred to Ole Miss, but had trouble transferring because some of the other schools he was looking at weren't going to pay the buyout that he had agreed to in his NIL deal with a with the AM whoever whoever paid for that AM schools did not pay directly for NIL. Um, and so he finally ended up at Ole Miss because they're the ones who were willing to pay that buyout. <laughs> and, and you know that sucks you're you're limiting a kid's options but at the same time you're an 18 year old who signed the contracts that's kind of the that's kind of a nice entry to the real world, and if you're getting compensated for it, oh well. So I think legally, without that buyout, Walter Nolan would have had to come back to College Station and do autograph signings and uh, charity work or whatever else the collective was saying he was going to do based on the terms of that contract if he wanted to pay out. Right, and I do think that you know talking about the concept of of now, of course, start talking about contracts. It means you're bringing in agents, and things get icky real well, fast it, after I that think it'll get, i think it'll get to collective bargaining I, I think you'll have a player term sheet not similar not a, not dissimilar to what major league baseball has for their minor league players one of the big stories though that came out of the off season of this season i wanted to get to you because you mentioned the ncaa being toothless toothless and i feel like 
uh, they've become an annoyance in so many ways, particularly at the college football level, is Jim Harbaugh was going to go and celebrate the national championship with his team by being a team captain, going back to Michigan, and the NCAA, NCAA freaked out. And when last I saw that Michigan has acquiesced. Um, can we just get to the point where it's okay for Jim Harbaugh to go and celebrate with his guys and celebrate the university winning a national championship and who cares about what happened in the past? It's it, the NFL or the, excuse me, the NCAA has always been known for their selective enforcement of rules. Um, and you know, one of the jokes in the SEC is that LSU has been caught uh, violating a rule, so uh, Louisiana Monroe is going to be on probation for the next two years. Uh, because that's that that's how it's worked. Miami uh, University of Miami had a lit litany of um, scandals in the what early two thousands, and I think got a game taken off their total record. I mean, there was virtually nothing, even though the perpetrators admitted everything they were doing. Right. Um, NCAA couldn't enforce anything, and that's where they are at this point. So they pick and choose their battles, and with Jim Harbaugh, they pick. Well, we'll just punish him even though there's 10 other schools doing the exact same thing he's doing. And it's became this always selective enforcement thing. Um, and, and when you're only selectively enforcing things, it's none of it's really legally viable anymore. The NCAA is finding that most of the stuff that they had decided were rules couldn't be legally defended. Um, and, and some of it was just onerous, man. It's like, okay, well, you're on a recruiting trip, but it's not an official recruiting trip. So they can the school can keep you there all day, but they can't feed you. And if you're a kid that comes from the extreme <laughs> poverty we were talking about, you better bring some lunch money because if that coach dares to give you a sandwich or a box bag of chips, that's a recruiting violation. It's incredibly myopic, right? Like it, it, it um, just misses the, misses the point in so many ways. Like you're trying to uh, stop the gold, the gold Trans Am and instead you're end up stopping the, the ham sandwich Yep, from a kid um, that was hungry. I and it's uh, the NCAA is a concept whose time has passed. Uh, it, it, it came and passed. Uh, it is dying. And I think it's even the schools who won't break away will find some other organization to or create some other organization, frankly, to oversee to govern their sports uh, because they're just. I, I think there's too much baggage. I, I think there's too much baggage. I think there's too much uh, ill will, and they've proven to be so largely ineffective that I, I just don't see how they survive. If they were a corporation, they wouldn't have a business. Yeah, I mean, it was dumb when they took Reggie Bush's Heisman's away years later, and then it was dumber that they gave him back. So it's like, I don't quite understand. One of the things I want to talk about, a little breaking news, if you could explain – Two fans out there, particularly, I mean, we most are going to have Longhorn and Aggie fans watching. You had made the joke about Cotton Holdings sponsoring the thing. Uh, talk a little bit about this, um, explain to people this new matchup thing that's happening between uh, our two institutions of higher learning. It's a renewal because Cotton Holdings is in the restoration business, and so they've restored the rivalry. Um, so <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, the well, that was actually from the press conference I watched yesterday. The um, Lone Star Showdown in pa in the past was just a trophy that went back and forth. I think want to say for seven, maybe ten years between A and M and Texas, depending on who won the football game. And when that series ended after the 2011 season, a Justin Tucker. Do I still hate Justin Tucker? I do still hate Justin Tucker. You know yeah, we I have a picture. More? We have a picture I of him hate, next I to the, the president. I referee who called pass interference on a guy who was five yards away from the receiver. That's who I hate more. But that's a whole different. <laughs> that's a, that's for your therapist, man. We got to move yeah. on. Um. Anywho, so that that series ended at that point, and so flash forward to 2024, where A and M and Texas will start playing again as members of the SEC uh, on an annual basis, not only in football but in all sports um, that both teams compete in. Cotton Holdings is now sponsoring the Lone Star Showdown Trophy, which will be similar to the Director's Cup, or I guess the Sears Cup, it has been called in the past. Uh, it's an athletic department award. So basically, head-to-head -head matchups will count, non-head-to-head -head matchups will count, and each team, from what I'm understanding, is getting to take their best 19 results uh, oh, okay. from an athletic standpoint. 
So football head to head would be one team or the other would get a point. But if you guys are, and I'll just make something up. If you guys are national championships in Quidditch and we are national championships in heat judging, and those are both NCAA sports, we get to pick points. We get to take those points, even though we don't compete head to head. Oh, that's so like you guys theoretically in, in real world could win because like we don't have a rodeo team. You guys do. So you, you guys right. could win, use those points if you win the rodeo thing, which I wish we had a rodeo team. That would be kind of cool. Um, but you know, you look at some of it. It's why don't why does neither school have uh, gymnastics programs? They should. Oh, wow. Yeah, we don't. Texas is a hotbed of gymnastics, especially women's gymnastics. Neither team has especially schools. in the especially in the A&M sphere of influence. And I mean, the woodlands, right? Like, yeah, that's where they all are. But yeah, so there there, there will be things um, that we can beat head to head on. Certainly, I think the first matchup that will count will be the volleyball match in Austin. I want to say they said it was September 11th. Um, and then football obviously is happening at the end of November. Still on Saturday, guys. Not going to be on Thursday. Stop guessing that it's going to be on Thursday. It's not ever going to be on Thursday. Yeah, I think even uh, both both ads acknowledge that in the presser, right? That the, the talk about things have changed. The NFL now owns all of Thursday, and that's just the way it is. And you know, I think they want to get the game moved to Friday eventually. But yeah, it's going to be Saturday this year. Yeah, I think um, Del Conte uh, and uh, Trev Albert both said basically the same thing that they would like to see it on Friday evening because that would be the least amount of competition to get the most eyeballs on that game. Uh, and that's I'll, I'll put this as nicely as I can. Usually if Texas wants something, they end up getting it. So that wouldn't surprise me happening in the next year or two. Um, but right now it's going to be on Saturday this year. It's not going to be an neutral site. That's what everybody else was freaking out about. There's no way, A, that either school would agree to that, but especially no, no way that Texas agrees to that, knowing their other big rivalry game is also at a neutral site. You're losing a home game twice a year. Yeah. You, just, you need ticket sales, frankly. I mean, we all do. Uh, so yeah. nobody nobody's going to go play that at Reliant or at AT&T Stadium. That's just not a thing that's going to happen. Um, so it should be interesting. You guys are so much better at this point in Olympic sports. Uh, I think you've got a natural advantage. So it'd be interesting to see how this top 19 sports thing works out. I think that was done to even those things out. Because there's, I mean, obviously... Swimming and diving, you guys, I mean, if you just, anybody who watched the Olympics and saw all the swimmers with uh, Longhorn silhouette on their swim caps knows how how good the swim program was right. in Texas. Um, track and field, a and had the upper hand for a while, but Texas has always had a good program. Maybe those are more even, but there's going to be things that you guys do extremely well. I bring up quit and you get, because I know you're like two to three time national champions. I think we're actually like five times, and I care about that stuff. I think we're like five time national championships and champions in Quidditch. We should we just quit playing. Right. But, you know, in the world of equestrian and meat judging. <laughs> right. You, <laughs> I was going to say that we just kind of roll the Hall Crux right out there, but that's the wrong thing um, in Quidditch. I forgot what they play with the, oh, it's the, yeah, it's, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I'm back. Um, yes. Right. I was, so the, the, my last thing I wanted to talk about though, was um, you and I had been decidedly lukewarm on this thing coming back. I think you and I are probably, I'm not going to speak for you, but are even still a little lukewarm for wanting to bring this back. Um, where are you now about this whole like bringing the the rivalry back? Knowing, no, I mean we have have we seen this thing in the Twitter area era really yet? Because I'm not sure. I'm not sure no, we have. Not, in... not, I mean, especially not what Twitter is now. Um, but yeah, it's. I don't know if lukewarm is the right word. I don't. I, I did not miss playing Texas every year. Um. And it wasn't because I was scared to play them. And, and I'm not doing the pick my own timeline thing, but in my lifetime, it's been a fairly even matchup. I, I, I understand what the season, the all time record is. I understand you guys are way ahead. I understand we'd have to win, what, 40 years in a row to be close. Um, all understood. In my lifetime, it's been always kind of an easy matchup or an even matchup. So it's not something that I'm like, okay, we don't want to play them because it's just a tough game. Uh, Having said that, I didn't miss it. We had enough on our plate with Alabama and LSU and uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State and everybody else we play in the SEC. 
And so there was some novelty. I don't hate that we're playing the game. It's not it's not gonna make my season one way or the other if we win or lose that game unless that's gonna keep us out of the playoffs. Sure. That that's kind of where I'm at. Um I do think that I got a little preview because I'll call him George because I don't know his name. As I was moving my daughter into college um, earlier this week, I was I had my Aggie ring on and he, some guy sat down while I was putting together shelving and decided to tell him, ask me, are you an Aggie? Well, I'm a Longhorn. Did not go to school there. But that's beside the point. Did um, he not go to school there? No, he didn't go to school there. Oh, uh, you guys are in trouble this year and I think we're going to win the national championship. And, and that's the... I just, I, it's just a beating. I don't care about your opinion of my school, especially. And I really don't care that you think you're going to march to the national championship. I think there's going to be a 12 team playoff. And in a 12 team playoff, I, I don't think it's going to be quite baseball where anything can happen, but there's going to be upsets. And for you to predict this shit in the middle of August is just weird. Yeah. But I think in that, I have a feeling this is going to become one of our running commentaries of the of the conversation is i think because it, and i feel like i've run across I, obviously not every single graduate of both schools have i run across this but there's a little bit more of um i feel like a tempered enthusiasm and more of a mutual respect and also an understanding that and i'll use the joke and i know that both of both schools have big followings that didn't go there i get it and you need that that's you don't become big athletic departments without selling t-shirts at walmart but University of Texas at Walmart can do that because at the end of the day, win or lose, there really is no emotional investment the same way there is for you and I, because we go, we went to school there. We still have some of our best times of our lives were there. And so all of it adds up to, it's all one big pot of emotion. It isn't just, well, the Longhorns lost, but I'm also kind of a Florida state fan. So I'll root for those today, which is kind of how I often see some of those folks. Up the end. At the end of the day, the pride that I have in my school is not tied to what we do on athletic fields. It sure. certainly can be magnified by it. Um, and I was very happy up until the last two games of the College World Series. And, and frankly, I was happy to be there um, and should have won. And I was equally dismayed by what happened immediately after that because it happened immediately after that. And that's a little sore subject for Aggie fans right now. But I think both baseball programs are going to turn out for the better for it. Uh, you guys got the guy you wanted. We maintained our roster um, and seemed to be on the upswing on recruiting. So you can work wherever you want to. Good for you. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't change the memories I have of uh, being a camp counselor or the stuff I did in journalism program or whatever those things were on campus and the reason I still wear my AM ring at 53 years old. Um, and it's not going to. So it's. I think that's what turns me off and why I didn't miss it is the people who have no real emotional involvement in it deciding that I should feel shame for the result of a football game. Like a football game and, and one of your one isolated game in the 30 years of your alumni or however long it's been. No, I, mean, it's, it's, I didn't play. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't been on a roster in years. <laughs> and longer than that, yeah. Almost ever. <laughs> Almost ever. I think my last roster I was on was the freshman year at St. Pius X. That was the last football roster I was on. Yeah, I mean, so it's, yeah, it, it's, I, I will enjoy the fact that this show will have a little bit more meat to it because of that. And we're clearly going to be building towards something at the end of the year. But I don't need a bunch of, oh, you guys suck because you suck and you exist because you suck and suck because you exist. It's it just, it's mindless dribble. And uh, frankly, you get enough of it being an Astros fan uh, yeah. with the trash can jokes that I don't need another source of it. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I, I'm very interested to see how Texas navigates the SEC. I know that you may feel that it's a little bit overblown. I do think week to week you have tougher games than you had in the Big 12. Uh, Kansas is okay right now, but there is not really a Kansas in the league outside of Vanderbilt. And the gap between... Uh, before the last couple of years, Vanderbilt would have beat Kansas pretty handily. That's Let me clarify, like, like I, and I want to clarify this because I think it goes back to our former show with our former co-host. I don't think that they're overblowing the difficulty of the SEC. I think one individual was overblowing how unprepared, as if Texas didn't think about how hard it was going to be when they transferred over, and that somehow they're going to have the same results as Arkansas. 
because those two are not the same. They just aren't. The resources are not the same. The alumni base is not the same. How they recruit is not the same. So they're, we're not going to have the same 20 years in the wilderness that Arkansas had. And that's all I say. That's all I'm saying about it. Yeah, no, it's more of, it's just, uh, it's a beating. Um, because on paper, every year you should be Mississippi State. But every year Mississippi State has these guys that you've never heard of before that weigh 350 pounds and just wear your guys out. And then that's fine. You win that game, but the next week you've got another team that does the exact same thing. It's just, it's grinding. And I think depth is the thing that is hard to build until you're in it. Um, Texas got a great head start. Uh, they very clearly got to bank on the SEC name for a couple of years without playing that schedule. So they got to build up the roster. I think if they had hired a coach that wasn't Sarkeesian and knew what he was getting into, it might look a little bit different, but you, he built smartly. Um, your prior, your prior coach liked to get wide receivers and, and DBs, highly rated wide receivers and DBs. And that's great, except you have no line play. <laughs> Sark has been very good about recruiting offensive linemen and defensive linemen that are NFL-ready kind of guys, NFL prospect kind of guys. And, and so that bodes well for your future, I think, more so than somebody who – if Tom Herman was still the coach – I would feel a lot less nervous about you guys coming into the league from a winning perspective. Winning perspective, it'd be a long road to hope because I don't think this style of football would work week to week in the SEC. Um, you guys have started to build a roster that will compete in the SEC, and I think fairly early. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see, though, if injuries start mounting up, what the depth what the depth looks like. Yeah, and I do think that well, and and again, not to not to reiterate a document with somebody else, but I think that will actually be the difference is um, compared to that other school, they have depth, yep. and so you know we'll obviously we'll see anything that happen in a football season. Quinn Ewers blows his knee in game two. Everything looks different because now you're at you're asking a still not seasoned Arch Manning to navigate the schedule. But I like the chances of a third year senior who's been in the, the same program for three years and has gotten markedly better. My point is, yeah, I'm not underestimating any of it. Um, I'm still not sure if I wanted to be in the SEC. I'm still a little bitter about the whole Big Ten rumors that were going around. But I'm also not going to um, curl up and, and, and cry about no it. Problem. What's that? You had no U problem. Yeah, well, the OU problem, I think, is going to be gone for a while. That's the one benefit of all of this. I don't see them competing in no, the I SEC for the Big Ten. Were oh yeah, they it was an OU. The, the hip of the Big Ten said no. Nope. We'll it take Nebraska, a, but we're not taking Oklahoma. It was an OU can't read problem, unfortunately. Well, look, that's going to wrap us up for today, man. I was really enjoyed the conversation. Next week we'll get a little bit more into uh, previewing our teams. Um, you know, and and I think it's going to be a fun football season. It's going to be really fun to be able to met to match up with what'll be a fun end of our baseball season. So it'll be nice for us for a little while to kind of have a lot to watch. And maybe we can spend this week on each roster, not injuring another running back. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we have, yeah, it's a good thing. We both have deep running back rooms. Cause yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it was great that we signed in at Smith's kid. I don't think we were planning on playing him quite as much as he's going to be playing. <laughs> as long as he's wearing 22 and he can still avoid getting the big I, hit, he'll be fine. I, I believe that is the case. All right. Well, that's uh, Andy Tom Cheston, our favorite Aggie. I'm your hopefully favorite Longhorn. This has been Lone Star Yell Fight. We will see you next week as football season kicks off.